broadcasting now. How are you doing this morning, Jim? Very good, Mike. Very good. By this morning, I mean really afternoon because it's 12 o'clock. No, it went fast. Days go fast. So, so, Jim, before we get started, I have a question for you. If you're looking at me, do you notice anything different? Uh, let me look here. Let me zoom in. You don't even need to zoom in. You got okay. You need you need to smile. Oh, you you removed your gold tooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude. Uh, next time I see you at the office, I'll show you. I shaved last night, and first I shaved it into chops, yeah, and then I shaved it into a goatee, right. and then I shaved it into a handlebar mustache. Um, right. Although each step of the way, completely horrifying my wife, which was <laughs> um, amazing, and it made me giggle and laugh the entire time. So, yeah, uh, I did that. I did that pre before preparing for our Christmas party, if you remember, and uh, kind of did the same thing. And it's like you have stereotypes about people who have different facial hair. It's like chops. I'm not going to say what it is, but chops stands for one thing, and handlebar yes. mustache stands for another thing, and. I had all these preconceptions in my head about facial hair and kind of who they represent. So, well, I took one of them when I had the chops and the goatee and the mustache, and it was shaved here. My hair was all wild. My wife looked at it and was like, "Wow, you look like you just got it's like a mugshot, like you just got released from prison," which is <laughs> you know, plays into those stereotypes like you were just talking about. So, yeah, um, yeah. Show us the little bun on the back. You have a full bun or just a little? Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I have the. I'm not, I'm not going to cut the top for a while. Um, the catalyst to shaving, uh, I picked up food last week, went home, had lunch with my family, and we were eating at the kitchen table. And my wife looks at me and goes, you got to shave. I was like, why? And she said, because you have food stuck in your beard, and it is so gross. Um, so <laughs> that, was the, that, was that was the final straw. She said, enough well, is enough. That, that was <laughs> the final straw. It, it, she Except said, for shave so i said yes ma'am took her long uh, enough we've been telling you that for months no, well you guys she doesn't make fun of me like you guys have but she you know everybody else was making fun of me but it, it was time so everyone thank you for joining us today um i am mike hills i run our brokerage this is jim doolittle we are both avid investors uh, and we do these every tuesday different parts of our team members we have women's events and we have investment hours, and this is what the gurus got wrong. And the idea here is we're just sharing your knowledge. My promise to you is that at no point will anybody try to actually sell you anything. There's no book, there's no class, uh, there's not even a piece of real estate. This is just how we think about real estate, what we do to boost and juice our portfolios, and why, if you're interested, we'd like to help you. Jim, would you like to say a couple of welcome words before we get started? No, I just think this is a really exciting presentation. I'm glad we've got uh, quite a few on with us today, but uh, I know we've got a short window. Uh, you wanna try to do this in 30 minutes, so we've got plenty of time for Q&A after. We'll take questions during as well, but I think most of the Q&A we'll probably save for the end, don't you think? If, if you do have questions, there's a question section or a chat se section, just go ahead, email in your questions. I promise we will get to each and every one of them. We will talk for roughly 30, 35 minutes. I'll make sure we cover everything. And without further ado, uh, we're going to get started. Cool, cool. Um, hey, one other thing we always forget to say until the very end, Mike, but as, as we're going, if you think of ideas for future web webinars, content you want us to cover uh, in, the, in the future webinars, then we'd love that feedback as well. Just also put that in the Q&A section and we'll make note of it and probably do a, uh, a webinar just around that, if it makes sense. Yeah. You know, we are here to help you. This is a way for us just to communicate um, and teach people the knowledge that we have. So we are happy. Anything, any questions that you have, if we have the answers, we will happily share them. If we don't know the answers, we'll research them and share them with you. Because, uh, you know, th this is about all of us in community and growing and learning together. Cool, cool. Well, this is the Atlas team. Well, at least it was back in December and it has grown a lot. I don't know what the number is, but Atlas is growing like crazy. But this is the team, a pretty good looking bunch of people, I'd say. Um, all right, so today we're gonna talk about the gurus and why many of them are wrong. Um, myself personally, I think I estimated it, I've spent nearly $40,000 on training 
some of which is from gurus that includes books that includes coaching and a, a lot of other things. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from it. Some of it I've actually applied and made money from. Um, but honestly, the best information I got to help me get to where I am is through people that offered me information for free. Uh, Mike Hills, little shout out to him is actually one of one of those folks who gave me tons of information and got me started buying long-term rental properties. So let's talk a little about the gurus. Who, who are the gurus that we're talking about specifically? So we're talking about authors, coaches, brokers like us, but we're different, <laughs> wholesalers and financial advisors. And kind of what's their motivation um, as it relates you know, to real estate? Authors, I like authors because books are cheap, videos are cheap. Um, I've learned a fair bit from all the books I've read. Um, you know, most of everything I've read, I, I believe is to be true in, in all the different investing books, uh, coaches, this is probably the most expensive, uh, uh, type of guru service. Um, sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's just, you know, videos they have in the can, um, can be good, but it's very, very expensive. Um, you know, the speakers are the ones that book these big conference rooms in the hotels all around the country and then advertise on TV and, and online and so forth to fill those seats. Um, and then you pay all this money. Sometimes you pay money uh, to fill those seats and you find out really all they're doing is selling you something else. Uh, brokers is the easiest one, right? We all know what they're trying to do is they're trying to make a commission. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm a broker. Uh, there are how many brokers at Atlas? I forget, but Mike oversees the entire team of, of uh, brokers. And we'll talk a little bit differently about how we do brokering differently. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then wholesalers, a uh, very common source for, for deals uh, back when there was more distress and foreclosures in the market. Uh, not much inventory from wholesalers that I've seen as of late. Uh, the economy is just too good. Well, the real estate, uh, everyone has equity, I think is, is the main difference. Wholesaler will get a property under contract. Then they'll bring it to an investor like us like you and say, here's your price. And they mark it up from what they get at under contract. And that's, that's their fee. Sometimes that markup is a lot, a whole lot. And sometimes it's not. And then our Mike and mine personal favorite is financial advisors, right? They're trying to sell you products like stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds, annuities, and blah, 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 all this stuff where they make a commission. And what they will do is steer you away from real estate because they are not allowed to sell real estate and therefore they will discourage you from buying real estate. Now, one thing I want to add into this, I'm not saying any of these people are wrong or bad by nature. I am simply saying um, there are better ways to make money out there. And one of the questions that I always ask people that are trying to sell me something is, this sounds great. Do you use this as a product? And the people that tell me no, I usually end the conversations right then and there because I don't want to work with people that aren't following their own advice. It does not make sense. Uh, somebody did just chat in that says there are a lot of non-commissioned stock brokerages now. There are, but what you get with non-commissioned stock brokerages in a lot of instances is you don't get any advice. So now you can make the trades yourself um, for very, very cheap, but you don't get any advice. Now, my father was a financial planner. He didn't consider himself a stockbroker. He could sell stocks, but he did financial planning for people specializing in retirement planning. And even him over the years, I finally showed him why real estate wins compared to the stock market. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Cool. So let's talk about, oops, sorry. Let's talk about our motivation at Atlas, my motivation, Mike's motivation, just to get it out on the table. So we're per perfectly transparent. First and foremost, Mike and I get a rush out of talking to clients and prospective clients about their financial goals and how real estate can play a role in that. Um, we believe that that real estate is the fastest way to create, to uh, achieve financial freedom. Um, and I'm always happy to share my stories, both what I've learned, uh, my successes, my failures, and I've had plenty of both. And so has Mike, but, uh, but it has really worked out along the way. Um, our other motivation is, is since we're a brokerage is to sell you investment assets. Um, we specialize in investment properties under $3 million all the way down to, I sold a $200,000 condo 
uh, about a month ago and all the way up to about $3 million. That's, that's our uh, sweet spot for our investment property. Um, and then we are also, Atlas is also a property management company. That's not the division that Mike and I are in, um, but uh, we do property management entirely different than any other property manager that I know of. Um, and I think if you're considering having a third party property manager on current properties or future properties, you owe it to yourself to at least take a few minutes to understand how Atlas does it and see if that's uh, a good fit for you. The one, the one thing that I will say, when we built our brokerage and when we built our property management company, our people are not paid the way most um, either property management companies or brokers are. So as an example, when Jim sold that $200,000 deal versus last month, Jim closed a $200,000 condo and a $925,000 apartment. And both of those were treated the same to him. He didn't get any more or less commission on the $200,000 deal versus the $900,000 deal. Why? Because the way brokerage is set up, the way property management is set up in most of the United States is a very parasitic way. It's what have you done for me lately? And, and brokers are trying to squeeze every dollar out of you. And most people listening have probably had an experience with somebody trying to upsell them something because the salesperson makes more money. And our people don't. Jim is on salary. He gets quarterly bonuses and yearly bonuses tied to units, tied to production, not tied to dollar volume. Because I don't want our people to treat you as our consumers and our clients and our customers as a dollar sign. And that is really, really important to us. And we built our company, both brokerage and property management, the exact same way. We'll talk about property management in a little, in a little while, but that is one of the things that absolutely makes us different. Uh, and it's one of the things we take pride in. Yep. I don't know anybody else, another brokerage who does it that way. I've never heard of it. Um, and it is awesome. It's awesome for us and it's awesome for our clients. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit. Oh, excuse me. There we go. Um, about Atlas and our method, our investment thesis, and how we look at uh, how we look at at our business of of long term rentals. We ask ourselves anytime we're going to buy an asset or make a dis make a uh, investment related decision on a future asset or a current asset. We ask asset. We ask ourselves several questions. First one is, am I looking at a market that has that has a, tw a good appreciation story over the next 20 years. In other words, can I, with a high degree of certainty, feel very, very confident that this market, this neighborhood is going to appreciate over 20 years and I'm going to make a lot of money on appreciation. There are markets like Denver where half of my portfolio is where I can absolutely check that box. There are other markets where my, the other half of my portfolio is uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, where I just cannot check that box. And I'll talk more about Memphis because um, that's where I've done some investing and that's where I've made some, made some mistakes and paid, some, paid a pretty big price for it. Um, then we ask ourselves, we're in a 20 year market now, are we in the path of development? And this is more kind of on a neighborhood level, right? We used to think of Swansea as an example here in Denver uh, as definitely not the path of development. Now there's an enormous pro highway project going on and um, there are some that are betting on Swansea being the next path of development. Um, so things, things like that. Cash flow, I used to say cash flow is king um, before I really um, learned to appreciate appreciation, if you will. Um, I still say cash flow is very important. Don't get me wrong, but uh, appreciation is at least equally important. Um, and then property management. We've talked a little bit about how we do it differently, but whoever you hire to be your property management company, they need to be rock solid because they can make or break an investment. Um, and then with all of these things in mind, what do we do here at Atlas is we put clients in, into performing assets, long-term rentals, whether that's single family, multifamily, like I said, from 200,000 to three, $3 million is, is, is our sweet spot. Oftentimes we find that clients own properties that have appreciated so much that now it makes sense to capture that equity, redeploy it into a higher performing asset. And that's another service that we, that we provide. Commonly known as a 1031. Let's exchange out of this property into a larger property for, for higher returns. All right, so we said we talk a little bit about property, our property management. Let's do this really quickly, Mike. Uh, 
when we do property management, there are no hidden fees. Look out for others who do have some hidden fees and upsell like tiers that you can buy into for higher levels of service, which in my opinion should be part of the base level of service. Uh, we don't play that game. Uh, we are collecting 97%. Uh, we are occupied and collected 97%, and this is during COVID. Um, I've seen some national numbers, which I'm not going to repeat because they vary so widely. Nowhere close to 97%. So that's a huge, uh, you know, feather in Atlas's cap on the property management side. And then a renewal rate. If someone's not a tenant's not happy with their property management company, they're going to bail at the first chance they get. Well, at Atlas, we have an 82% renewal rate, very well above the industry standard. Um, and another sort of point of pride for us that we're providing a good service if they want to renew with us. And then Mike touched on um, how as a broker, we are not commission-based. As our property managers, however, they are uh, compensated based on money collected. This is absolutely huge. So obviously someone has to be in the, the property and they have to be paying rent in order for the owner, the investor to, to uh, collect. And so we, we incentivize, sorry, incentivize our property managers to make money only when the investors make money. The one thing that I would say about this, when we built our property management division, we are owners of real estate and we're owners and investors first. And so we wanted to build both the property management division and the brokerage as though we were the end users and get rid of all the crap that I can't stand about the way other companies operate. And that's the way we built this company and happy to get into the weeds and the details of what that means later. But I, I just, I want everybody listening to know that we've really tried to do this with your best interest in mind. Not even with your, I never met you, with my best interest in mind as an owner of real estate. Cool. All right, let's jump into our first myth. We've got three myths from uh, the gurus that we want to tackle. Uh, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> learned some lessons related to all three of these myths. Uh, so let's talk about the first one. Myth number one, buy cheap properties for higher cash flow. What they're talking about is markets where property is very cheap. So I'm going to compare, you're going to hear me compare Denver to Memphis a lot because half my portfolio is in Memphis, half is in Denver, and the performance is like night and day. Um, and at the end of the day, I wished I never invested in Memphis and what took me six months to build out there is probably going to take me what feels like six years to get out. Um, but um, I'm working on it. So that's what they say. Buy cheap properties for higher cash flow. Who says this? This is like, this is wholesalers. This is brokers who are operating in markets with cheap assets. Uh, Memphis is one that I mentioned. Birmingham is another. Jacksonville, uh, Cleveland. I'd say there's about 10 or 12 around the U.S. major markets that are, that are, cheap property markets, we call them cash flow markets. Um, but these are, these are just, uh, uh, just, a, just a few. And then what do they say in these markets? Well, what got me the lesson, the hardest lesson I've learned in Memphis is the assumption that we use for, uh, for operating expenses. So uh, let me go over here to my whiteboard if I can get this to work and show you what I learned the hard way. One of the things too, while Jim's uh, efforting his whiteboard, one of the things that, that I want you to think about when you're talking about um, the cheap cash flow markets, I would say follow population. Are people moving to these cities? If the answer is no, then that's not something that I want to that that I, that I probably want to to uh, get into, and we'll talk about that here in a second because Jim has his whiteboard ready. All right, cool. So I've got three scenarios here, right? I've got, I mentioned Denver where I have half my portfolio and then Memphis, the myth, the myth part right here. And then the Memphis, the truth. This is where the hard lesson came, <laughs> uh, where I learned the hard lesson. So let's talk about these scenarios. So first one is here in Denver in my portfolio, my average rent is, my average rent is uh, 1800 bucks. That's very different from Memphis where my average rent is $800. And why is, that, why is that such a big deal? You think everything would be the same proportionately, but it's not. Um, a lot of it is, but the operating expenses are not. So a good number for operating expenses in Denver is 30%. That means that 30% of the rents that we collect, we can expect that to go towards our operating expenses, taxes, insurance, uh, maintenance management, utilities, and repairs. 
uh, that's a good number. However, that's not a good number in a cash flow market where there's um, where the rents are very, very, very cheap. So I went into Memphis thinking 30% would be the same. I would just use the same number in Denver. And this is what the guru told me as well, is that the operating expense ratio would be 30%. However, the reality is, here's what's really happening. It's really 47%. Here's the example Mike likes to use, right? If a water heater goes out in Denver, let's say it costs 800 bucks. Well, guess what? In Memphis or other cash flow markets, it's still 800 bucks. The difference is you're making so much more in rent and so much more net operating income that you can absorb that cost of a hot water heater a lot easier when, you're, when your rents are higher than when rents are lower. So if we just jump ahead, here's the operating expense using these assumptions, all right? And what ends up being your NOI. Let's say you have a tenant turn, a $2,500 tenant turn. Now this is a pretty big te expensive tenant turn. The average is probably a lot, a lot less than this, but- um, the average, the additional average is $1,560. Okay. All right, well, let's use my 2,500 for now. <laughs> because the numbers uh, work out work out very conveniently, right? And so what ends up happening is if you have a $2,500 tenant turn and your rents are $1,800 a month, well, that ends up swallowing about two months of your net operating income right here. Hey, Jim, real quick, we got a question. Let me interrupt. Uh, for, for those listening and watching, a tenant turn means a tenant moves out and you have to re-get the house ready for uh, um, a new tenant and think somebody moves out, they've been there three years, carpet, paint, and an appliance or two. That's what a tenant turn is. So 2,500 bucks, it's actually a really fair number. If you gotta replace some carpet, replace some paint, um, had somebody there for a year or two, and people move out, whether it's Denver or Memphis or Seattle or New York or Chicago or Dallas or LA, people move out. And the point of this, carpet and paint is carpet and paint. It does not matter where you buy it, the cost is the same. Go ahead, Jim. Yep, no, that's, that's exactly the point we're trying to make. So this $2,500 tenant turn, uh oh, excuse me, uh, absorbs two months of my NOI here when my rents are $1,800, but it absorbs six months of my NOI when my rent is $800. So that's a big time difference. So the, in other words, the expenses when your rents are really, really low in this scenario, are they hurt three times as much as they do when your rents are high at 1800 bucks. So if you're going to buy in any market, be sure you have a good sharp number for your operating expenses. In Memphis, it is not 30%, I promise you. It's 47%. So whatever market you're investing in, be sure you use a sharp pencil on that number because it changes everything. The other thing that uh, we hear a lot is people will say, well, you know, but I bought in Memphis, Mike or Jim, I bought in Memphis because the house was $55,000 and that's what I could afford. I can't afford a house in Denver because a house in Denver is $250,000. That may seem true. We can coach you on how still to buy and finance those houses in Denver. I would still make the argument that while it feels like you're making less money and Jim's going to get into why, why Denver versus a place like Memphis, Denver is still better. It may not feel like it. Your dollar stretches further in a place like Memphis because you can buy a, a, a more house because they're cheaper, but in the end, you're actually costing yourself money. Absolutely. Yeah, you're short, you're short sighting yourself on what your total return could be. All right, that's myth number one. Let's jump to myth number two here. Here's another thing we hear all the time is real estate is risky because of the debt. And that is so absolutely not true, assuming that you are being wise with your debt, right? We're not talking about an over leveraged situation. Um, but, you know, financial planners are famous for saying, you know, that are, are, are for saying not to buy uh, real estate because that's a competing asset that one, they can't sell. And two, they know the returns are higher on real estate. So they want to steer you away from investing in real estate, invest more with them so that they can make a commission on the assets, the investment assets that they do sell. And then they'll quick to remind you, I've heard that, uh, you know, of, of the last recession and, and what happened to real estate during the last recession. And 
it was brutal and ugly, don't get me wrong. I'm not dismissing the pain and suffering that happened during that recession, but let's remember that real estate was, or actually the debt on the real estate was the catalyst for that recession. Um, and now there are all kinds of laws in place that Obama's administration passed that are prevent that exact same scenario from ever happening again. Um, and then, um, and then listen to your lender, right? If they say they won't lend, lend to you, then it's probably because they don't want you to be over leveraged, right? If you're working with a bank and you're not borrowing the down payment from cousin Benny, um, so that you're hundred percent leveraged, um, don't do that. If you're putting the down payment that the lender makes you put down, you're not going to get over leveraged. And then the point that I think is most important in all this is how do you make real estate debt? How do you make it safe? Right. I have over 2 million, Mike, I don't know how much debt you have. Um, we have, we both have seven figures worth of debt. And I, I assure you, we both sleep well at night, um, not worrying about the debt. And that's because we've made it safe. Um, we've made it safe by having at least a 20% cash flow cushion. What I mean by that is if I have to reduce my rents in a horrible, and I mean a horrible market by 20%, which is a very, very large reduction to cover my debt and to cover my operating expenses, I can do that. If I buy right so that I have that 20% cushion, I have the option of lowering my rents by 20%, which like I said, is a lot just to cover my operating expenses and my, and my debt service, meaning I'm not gonna have to give this asset back to the bank. Um, so that's how the cash flow, in my opinion, is what makes the debt, is what makes the debt safe. And uh, here's what I would add. The wrong kind of debt, and I'll just list a few, hard money loans, interest only loans, adjustable rate mortgages. The, that's what, when we say the wrong kind of debt, those are the, the big three, the big three that people do that really gets them in a pinch. I owe millions of dollars to the bank right now. And you know what I'm actually currently trying to do right now is borrow more, sell some of my assets and trade up and borrow a bunch more. Literally, I'm working on borrowing $3 million more right now. But when I buy three, when I borrow $3 million more, I'm actually going to buy assets worth more than four million bucks. So I'm going to put a million bucks of my own cash in so that I can get what's referred to as 75% loan to value, which means 25% of my is my cash. 75% is borrowed from the bank. The wrong kind of debt is crazy risky. And you're going to hear sales pitches out there, hard money loans, interest only loans, adjustable rate mortgages. Nope. Don't do it. We will coach you on the wrong kinds of debt. I've had the wrong kinds of debt sometimes and it got me in a pinch and will help you stay away from those kinds of loans. I like the one, no money down is my favorite one. Risky, uh, risky. Uh, <laughs> all right, myth number three. Let's keep moving along here. Appreciation doesn't matter. Now, man, have I learned a hard lesson on this one. So. When I started buying in Memphis, Tennessee, I was drunk on the cash flow. Remember, I used to say cash flow is king. Now I say cash flow is important, but it is not the, the end all. Um, my story, the short version, is I was actually laid off from a corporate position after 22 years, had zero income. And my household, family of four, was burning about 15 Gs a month. And I couldn't help but think, how hard did I have to work in my corporate job how many nights did I have to travel and be away from my family and make all those other sacrifices in order to make enough income so that I could, and then pay taxes and then save $15,000. And that's what we were burning every month. So I was extremely motivated to generate cash flow to replace, to replace that income because I had no intentions of going back to the corporate world and, and, and the corporate lifestyle. I did not have put enough, uh, attention on appreciation. I've since learned that. And that's why I'm trying to get out of Memphis as, as quickly as I can. So um, let's see who, who is, who is saying appreciation doesn't matter. Well, it's, it's, again, it's brokers and wholesalers um, and they're working in markets that don't appreciate very much. The reason the real estate is so cheap is because it hasn't appreciated uh, over a long period of time. And it likely isn't going to appreciate at anything, um, meaningful uh, uh, going forward. So 
they'll 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 tell you that appreciation doesn't matter, cash flow is key, and cash flow is the only thing that matters. Well, I've made more money in Denver on appreciation than I have on cash flow, even though all I cared about was cash flow. So that's honestly just dumb luck, but I'm certainly grateful for that dumb luck. They'll say you can't feed your family on appreciation. Um, this is true. You can't feed your family today on appreciation, but you can put your kids through college tomorrow because of appreciation. So it's a little longer term horizon, but it adds up quick and it's big, big time money. Um, and then markets go up and down. You can't count on appreciation. Also a true statement, but real estate goes up far more uh, more years than it then it goes down if you look at real estate over, over the long term. Um, here's the real story though. Appreciation is compounding. Our friend Albert Einstein said that compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And appreciate compounding appreciation is the same concept. He says that uh, there are, it's the eighth wonder of the world. He said that there's people who pay it and then there's people who earn it. And I think you know which side of that uh, of that you want to be on. Let me draw up um, this, this little thing on uh, leveraged appreciation because this is what is really, really powerful. Well, while, Jim's uh, doing that, uh, while Jim's getting that to work, here, here's one of the things that we are actively, uh, that we actively say. Appreciation follows population patterns. Where I buy my real estate is where people are moving. I don't want, want to own real estate that has negative or flat population growth. Because think about it. If you have negative or flat population growth, this is simple supply and demand economics. If people aren't moving there, prices don't typically go up. If people are moving there, prices go up. These are the things, the major thing. We pop, follow population trends very, very closely. Simple supply and demand economics. It's one of the things that drives appreciation. And it's one of the things that we do. Now, while Jim's getting into this, I want you to think about it like this. Anything that you buy in Southern California, you can make the argument that it's going to appreciate. It's a 20 year market. Anything that you, you buy in Southern California though, it's so expensive, you get negative cash flow. Anything you buy in the, not anything, but for the most part, anything you buy in the middle of the country, Memphis, Cleveland, you know, Birmingham, the, the places that Jim was talking about, you're gonna get no appreciation, but you're gonna get good cash flow. Mike Hills wants to own and sell you places where we're going to get both 20 year appreciation and uh, um, cash flow. Those are the things that we're, that we are after. That's why we buy in the markets that we did. Uh, Jim, we have a question while you're drawing that. Uh, what do you think about reports that Denver's market is overvalued and houses prices will decrease next spring? Wait to buy until then. While you're writing that up, Jim, let me answer that. So that's been said for the last four years. Um, maybe the last five years, that Denver's prices are overvalued and the prices are going to decrease. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. If I did, we'd all be in Vegas. But here's the truth of the matter. Uh, inventory right now in Denver is less than 30 days, which the way the stats break down is if there's three months or less of inventory turn on the market, it's a seller's market. If there's six months, it's an even market. If there's nine months, it's a buyer's market that's not gonna change anytime soon. Interest rates are incredibly low. The other thing that is happening because of COVID, that some of the stuff that this has been, um, been uh, forecast by some of the biggest forecasters, Zillow being one of them, is Denver is one of these cities that is likely to get um, a, a population increase because people are moving out of LA, they're moving out of Seattle, they're moving out of New York, they're moving out of Chicago. And what happens when people move to one spot? Prices go up. Now, interest rates are likely to go up sometime in the next year or two because our federal government is floating cash into the market. And the only way to combat that is through leverage, or excuse me, is through um, inflation. But I still like them. Though. And remember, I'm not buying for the next six months anyway. I'm buying for today for the next 20 years. COVID is gonna be a blip on my radar. I am not worried at all about the next year or two in terms of appreciation because, man, this is 20-year picture. Jim, looks like you're ready. Um, say hi to your cat for me. Otis, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, this is Otis. Let me put him down. He, he loves webinars for some reason. Here, hold on. Ah, 
Okay. So here's the story about leveraged appreciation. All right. Let's say you have an asset, an investment, long-term investment property, and this is the size of it, right? Well, we know that 25%, right, is your, is your down payment, right? And let's look at the appreciation rates kind of around the country, right? So we know that the national average is, is about three and a half percent. And we know that uh, Memphis is about one and a half percent, or I, I think that's actually ambitious, but the cash flow markets will say are one and a half percent. And then Denver is about four and a half percent over the over the long term, right? So here's the deal. If you own this asset outright and you don't use any leverage, right, and it appreciates at these at these rates, right? Um, so let's see here. Let's do. Let's do. Let me mark these. This is the nation. This is Memphis, and this is Denver. Okay. And let's say you don't put any any leverage down, right? And you just pay it with cash. Well, if you if if in this market it appreciates at three and a half percent, well, then your rate of return is going to be three and a half percent, right? Because you're not using any leverage. Same in Memphis, you'll get a one and a half percent return and in Denver, you'll get a four and a half percent return, right? Okay. Is that exciting? Not to me. Maybe I'm a greedy SOB, but I want a much higher return than, than that. And that's why I use leverage and the power of appreciation with leverage on top of it. So let's say you put 25% down, right? And you make a three and a half percent. Um, I'm going to use the national average. You use, and you make three and a half percent on the money that you put down that 25%. Okay. That's cool. Not cool enough, but that's cool. There's another 25%, another 25%, another 25%. Well, guess what? Without putting any more money down, right? You're also going to make three and a half percent on, on this quarter of the asset. Again, no no additional money down. You're going to make three and a half, <laughs> three and a half percent on this quarter of the asset. And finally, again, no additional money down. You're going to make another three and a half percent on this asset, right? So your rate of return, because you're using seventy five percent LTV, is actually seven times two is fourteen. Your rate of return is now fourteen percent. Now we're talking, right? That gets me up in the morning. I'll get up. I'll get out of bed for fourteen percent. By the way, this doesn't count the cash flow. This is in addition to, uh, in in addition to the cash flow. So let's say in Memphis, right? You have one and a half. Let's see, hang on here. In Memphis, you have one and a half percent on this quarter, one and a half percent on this quarter, one and a half percent on this quarter. Where you get three. Uh, you get you get a six percent return instead of one and a half percent because you're using leverage. Okay, still better than one and a half percent, but you know it's just okay. And then Denver is the story that we love to tell. Denver appreciates more than the national average. Everyone wants to live here. It's a great quality of life. People are moving here by the droves, um, right? So now we have a nine. Now we have an eighteen percent return on investment. So that's kind of the story behind. Uh, you know, appreciation and how appreciation and how leverage work together is so that you can get a much, much, much higher return. Right. And like I said earlier, I've made far more money on my rate of return for my appreciation than I have on my cash flow, even though all I was looking for was cash flow. Let me get, let me give you an example of this. Um, easiest way to do this is with, with examples. Um, uh, at three o'clock today, Denver time, I'm driving to one of my assets that uh, I bought a single family home in July of 2013. Um, I asked the tenant, I did not renew the tenant's lease. Um, she and her family moved out uh, last Friday, the 31st of July. I bought this house for $125,000. The after repair value, because I'm going to, she's lived there for seven years. I'm going to have to put some money into it to fix it up a little bit. The house is worth roughly between $300,000 and $330,000 today. When I bought that house, I put 20% down. So I put down, let for easy math, let's call it 25,000 bucks and had a mortgage value of $100,000 when I bought that house. When I sell that house, I'm gonna have more than a quarter million dollars in value. So my 20 grand has become $250,000 and I haven't had to do anything for it because my tenant has been paying it, paying my debt off and I've been making positive cash flow for the last seven years. And I'm gonna take that $250,000 
re-up just like Jim showed, and I'm going to buy a million dollar asset. And now I'm going to make that four, four and a half percent return on a million bucks rather than $300,000. It just makes sense. That's why we do it. That's why appreciation on leverage debt, the right kind of debt, absolutely matters. And we'll show you how. That's it. That's myth number. That's myth number three. Uh, oh, just one last thing. So if you look at appreciate, we get this all the time. You know, you can make more money uh, investing in the stock market uh, than you can in rental properties. Well, if you buy rental properties, right, uh, that is absolutely not true. Um, and here's a chart we did here that I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but this yellow line. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, so this, uh, this yellow line represents the S&P if you reinvest the dividends and make, I think we use like an 11% return. Is what I think the assumption we use, which I would argue is high, but nonetheless. Um, and here's the scenario for real estate over a 20 year period. This captures the, uh, the cash flow and the appreciation, assuming that you're using uh, leverage at 75% LTV. So as you can see, it's, it's just not even close. It's just not even close. Think of it this way, team. When you buy 100 grand worth of stocks, you buy 100 grand worth of stocks. When you buy 100, when you put 100 grand down on real estate, you can buy $400,000 of real estate. So if the stock market appreciates over time at 7%, you're making 7% of 100 grand. If real estate appreciates at 4%, for easy math, you're making 4% of 400 grand. So 7% of 100 grand is $7,000. 4% of 400 grand is $16,000. What would you rather have? It's just very simple math, but it's not what we are taught to do with our money. And that's what that's we're right. doing is we're trying to change the way we think about money and we think about the stock market versus real estate. Hey Jimbo, it is 1242. Uh, we've been speaking now for about 38 minutes. These last slides, let's roll through these. That way, if anybody has any questions, we can get to them. Just one last point and then we'll jump. Mike, you, I mean, I know you know this, Mike. I used to be this guy right here, right? I had a corporate job. I had a stock portfolio. I had an IRA. I had a pension. I had all the annuities, all the stuff that I'm supposed to have according to the system. And then I got a taste for real estate. I bought one house. I watched it perform. It was sort of my proof of concept. Uh, you know, five years after that, I'm 100% in real estate. I don't own any stocks any bonds, any mutual funds, any annuities, um, anything like that. So, and I'm making so you, much uh, more money that I'm making. How now. many single family homes do you own? Uh, I sold one last week. So now I have 27. 27 single family homes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jim, Jim uh, he's learned this through experience. This isn't BS. This is something he does every day. All right, we'll, we'll try to go fast for you guys. Okay. Um, so we can get to question. Say again. I said we're going to try to go through the last one fast okay. so we can get to question. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So this is just, you know, if, if you have real estate and you're worried about your real estate because of COVID or for some other reason, but these days it's really about COVID, give us a call. We'll evaluate your situation and we'll give you some advice. Chances are it's not as scary as it, as it looks. Um, and we've got lots of different uh, options and solutions that we can recommend for you that are specific to your situation and, and, and your goals. We even have a tool called the stress test tool. Uh, we're happy to provide that. You can put in your portfolio and then you can run scenarios to see, you know, how much hardship can you suffer because of this COVID thing and then still be above water. Uh, it's three tests that it, that it tests your portfolio on. It's a really, really cool tool. Um, if you need help finding the right deal, right? Good deals used to be available everywhere. And as Mike said, inventory is super, super tight. Um, so you need an expert to help you find uh, good investment properties. And Mike and I would never present a property to you that we wouldn't, we wouldn't buy for ourselves. Um, uh, on that question, Jim, we got a, a question from uh, uh, Vandy. Vandy said, what, what markets do we currently recommend for investment? Uh, Vandy, what we look for is we look for appreciating markets along with strong cash flow markets. I own real estate right now in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Phoenix. Um, I am personally going to expand into Salt Lake City in the near future and most likely Boise. But 
I'm not going to expand there until I do the property management there. Our property management doesn't have a base there because remember, you need a 20 year market, you need cash flow. But for me, the third piece of that is I have to control the property management because I don't like other property managers. I don't trust them. You can buy the greatest deal in the world, manage it like trash and lose money. You can buy a terrible deal, manage it well and make money. And you know what? I've done both of those. So I try to only buy stuff where I can control the property management and I trust our property management. So hopefully that answers your questions and it's all about population. It's where, where are people um, moving to? Uh, that's one of the things we're absolutely after. So hopefully that answers your question. Yep. So I think the categories uh, we have are the, we have categories like the cash flow markets like Memphis and Birmingham that we talked about. We have the blended markets where there's appreciation and cash flow like Denver and Phoenix and uh, Salt Lake City. There's there's quite a few of those. And then we have the markets like California that Mike talked about earlier where you are hard pressed to make any cash flow in those markets and your only return is going to be off of appreciation, which is really a high risk kind of situation as far as I'm concerned. Mike, we have yep. another question. We have a couple more questions. Uh, Vandy followed up with, what do I think of Texas? Here's what I would say about Texas. I like Texas a little bit. Problem with Texas is that they, they have no state income taxes, which means they have exorbitantly high property taxes. And because of those high property taxes, traditionally over time, it has actually held down the appreciation story in, uh, in the state of Texas. I really like Austin as a city. It's very similar to Denver. Um, but in general, uh, the, the, the property tax situation really bothers me. And I can tell you that that is something amid COVID um, that just watch, mark my words, I think what's going to happen is states are going to have to start raising taxes. And one of the ways they're going to do that is start raising property taxes. So um, states that have no state income tax really makes me nervous, especially in a, in a post-COVID world um, that we live in. So hopefully they answer that, that question. Hey, Jim, uh, are single families better than multifamilies? Um, no. But there's pros and there's pros and cons to to both. And by multifamily, I'm going to assume the question means small multifamily. Let's take let's take a quadplex for example. I think let's compare a quadplex to a to a single family home. I happen to own all single family homes. Um, I'm not opposed to multifamily. In fact, I'm pretty sure all of my future purchases are going to be multifamily. Um, I was under contract, if you remember, in Arizona on a multifamily just as COVID showed up, and I panicked and got myself out of the contract, but uh, there was just too much uncertainty. But now I'm still, I'm back in acquisition mode. I'll buy multifamily uh, most likely uh, going forward. Um, I've heard, I've never seen data on this, but I've heard that multifamily will appreciate more in a rising market. Uh, wait, I said that wrong. Single family will appreciate more in a rising market, but multifamily will preserve its value more in a falling market. So if you think you're one of those people who can time the market, I used to think I was one of those people <laughs> uh, when I was a stock investor and that never worked out, but um, it might be a bet on whether, uh, you know, whether you think the market's gonna go up or down, but honestly, you can't go wrong with either one. That's the honest truth. You can't go wrong with either one. If you buy right, buy a good deal, it, it matters very little whether it's a single family or multifamily. I can tell you that from my experience, what I have done, and I didn't necessarily do this on purpose, but I bought my first home, single family home in 2001, another single family home in 2003, another one in 2005, another one in 2007, another one in 2008. And what I've been recently doing, um, and then I bought again, single family homes in 2012 and 2013. What I've been doing over the last few years is selling off my single families and buying multifamilies. And the reason for that is multifamilies just have better cash flow. And when the prices of single family homes have gotten so high, like they are today, the math doesn't make sense, at least in Denver, to buy single family homes right now because they're just incredibly expensive. And the, the rents, the purchase price versus the rent ratios are really screwy. You just can't make very much money. So I like the rent ratios in the multifamily homes. In general, single family homes are probably going to appreciate a little faster than multifamily homes. Just for, again, simple supply and demand economics, more people want single family homes. Now, that said, what I will do, my, I told you I moved my tenant out of my place uh, last Friday, the 31st. I know that the buyer of that house is not going to be an investor. The buyer is going to be a retail buyer, somebody to buy it and move into it. So I'm going to renovate it, 
as such, because I just know who that buyer is. Um, so hopefully that, that answers um, that question. Uh, Jim, do we, do we source our deals mostly from the MLS or off market? Yeah, mostly from the MLS. Occasionally we'll get an off market deal, but uh, I'd say those are the exception. Um, one of the cool ways that we operate that, that I'm particularly proud of is we are combing the MLS, our acquisitions team, not Mike and myself, but is combing the MLS daily and nightly looking for deals, making lots and lots of offers. Most of those offers go nowhere, truthfully, but it's in hopes of landing a good price on a good asset. And then we lock it up in our name, uh, in the name of Atlas, uh, we get it under contract. That way we don't have to worry about any competing offers. Then we take that and we present it to our client. This asset most uh, best fits what this client has said they are looking for. So we present it to that client. That client has the option of saying yes or no. Um, if they say yes, then we simply assign the contract over to them and it goes through as a your very typical uh, real estate uh, transaction. Yep, to, to answer that question though, we, we get wholesale deals from time to time. Most of our stuff is either on LoopNet, CoStar, or the MLS. Um, or the other place that we get a bunch of our deals is brokers that we've previously done deals with. They know what our buy box is. So they call us, offer it to us first. They'll still put it on the MLS, but they give it to us first. Most wholesalers, we're not going to just do business with them because they, they just, uh, I'm not going to bash wholesalers, but most of them we, we, uh, we do not do business with because th their deals aren't, aren't as good as they think they are. Um, Jim, another question here. Is Denver a good market to wholesale and flip houses in? What makes a market good for wholesaling and flipping houses? Um, okay, wholesaling and flipping. Uh, so first of all, you know, I know a lot of, of the wholesalers around here in town. And uh, back when there was a lot of distress, a lot of foreclosures, uh, every now and then one of their deals was a good one. If you really make the right assumptions and do a good job of analyzing the, the deal, uh, not always listening to how they're, the numbers they're presenting to you. Um, but today there's very little distress. Um, even with COVID, everybody still has lots of equity. Uh, and so there's really not a need to sell to a wholesaler. It just makes more sense for homeowners and property owners to sell uh, on, on the, on the MLS with the, with a broker. So I just, their deals have always been kind of thin. They're right. especially thin, uh, in, in this, in this economy that we're in, uh, wholesalers. What was the second piece? Uh, wholesalers and flipping, same kind of thing. Let, let me jump sure. in and say yeah. this. I see more deals than most people for obvious reasons. I personally flip maybe two deals a year. And they have to be really good deals. Frankly, I bought a flip last Wednesday or last Thursday, the 30th of July. I did buy a flip. Now, I will flip that house. It'll likely be the only deal, the only flip that, I, that I'll do in 2020, only because it was a good enough deal that I couldn't let it pass up. Now, here's the difference. This is why I don't flip houses. Flipping houses makes you income. And I'm not interested in income from a real estate perspective. Being an owner of real estate builds wealth. I am about wealth creation, future cash flows, sending my kids to college, working with you because I like to, not because I need to make the money. So that's one of the reasons I shy away from wholesaling and sailing and flipping because it's all about transaction volume. It's all about cash flow. Excuse me. It's all about making money, not generating long-term income, recurring income and generating wealth. And I'm about wealth creation. So hopefully that answers that question. In terms of what markets are good markets, very simply, deals that you can buy cheaply and sell for more. And I would say that that's driven down by uh, or driven by where people are moving to. Um, next question. Hey guys, I live in Longmont, Colorado and plan on house hacking. I'm not sure where to. I don't know how familiar you guys are with house hacking. Should I focus on the more desirable areas like Denver? Um, we are very familiar with house hacking. I bought my first five houses. House hacking. Um, so very, very familiar with it. We have one of our presentations that's all on house hacking. Jim and I don't do this. Two of our guys that specialize in house hacking are doing it. One of our guys owns six houses now. The other owns a single family, a duplex, and he's buying a quadplex house hacking. So Taylor, that's from you. Email Jim or I, and we can absolutely help you. This is more um, lifestyle plus investment. It's a 
blend them to two, but happy to help you. Um, email, email, text, call, whatever, and we'll, we'll talk and show you how to do it. Jim, next question. How do you find a reasonably priced home in Denver right now? Even $500,000 to $750,000 homes are getting multiple offers. Is it really possible to make enough cash flow after paying the mortgage? The answer is yes, but not on a $600,000 single family home. You're not gonna do it. So Kristen, that was from you. Call us, we'll show you our method. Jim alluded to it and basically explained how we do it. We can absolutely do it. We're doing a bunch of them right now, but we are very, very picky. Think through it like this. In 2012, 13, 14, 15, shotgun approach. You could buy everything in Denver because we believed it was a 20 year market. We, we knew the cash flow was good. You could buy anything. Today, you cannot do that. You cannot make that boast. So what do we do today? Today, it's a sniper rifle approach. We buy very specific deals that we believe in over the long term. And Kristen, we'll use that sniper rifle with you. We'll show you how to do it. Uh, also uh, from Taylor, also I'm renting a room in a single family home, or should I look more into multifamily properties? We'll get to that. It depends on how much money you have, your credit score, uh, your purchase power, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some mitigating circumstances to answer that in this particular setting, but I like the way you're thinking. We'll absolutely be able to help you do that. Jim, we had another question come up. Um, do you only sell deals to your clients if, if they sign up for you guys to manage them, manage the property? Really good question. Absolutely not. If you own property and you just want us to manage it, but you didn't buy it from us, we'll manage it for you. If you want to buy a property and manage it yourself, we'll show you how to do it. Absolutely. We'll give you our lease. We'll give you our handyman. Like we will, we think you should let us use it. Let us manage it for you. But Lance or Landon, that's from you. Brother, if you want to manage your own properties, feel free. Because you know what I know? When you get too busy doing whatever it is you do for a living and you own four or six or eight or 12 or 15 properties, then you're going to call me and go, don't want to do it anymore. This is a ginormous headache. I know how to property manage. I don't manage any of my properties anymore because I don't want the headache. My time is better spent working with you. So know that that, uh, that is something that we absolutely um, think about, but you can manage yourself. Um, ooh, Jim, this one. Can you do a training on how to find those specific deals? Uh, Brianda, no, we'd be beating away our secret sauce. <laughs> I'm not gonna try, you're gonna make you competition for me. Not going to do that, but um, if you want to uh, to show, you know, to buy a deal, we'll absolutely help you. Um, there's some very specific things that we that we look at. I'm happy to talk about it, but it's not something that you know. I don't want to train a bunch of competition for me, Brianna. That, that, that doesn't yeah. that doesn't sound fun because then my inventory department would be really pissed at me for training you on how to be their competition. Um, uh, from Dan, if you buy a rental property in another state with the state income tax. Do you need to file that state's tax forms? The answer is yes. You do need to uh, file. Um, Jim, maybe how do you do it in Tennessee? Uh, yes, you 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 uh, you file a form. I just sign it and pay it. Honestly, I don't know the details, but yes, there is a there is a tax return that you pay that I pay in Tennessee. Yeah, and there's one that it's, I don't uh, pay in Arizona for the property. And I actually own a house in California as well, so. Um, now my California property is not an investment property. It's to take care of family member. And that one's a, a thorn in my side regularly. Um, so we'll eliminate that one. Um, that one actually costs me money. It's not income, but that's because I'm a, a good family member, even though I don't want to be, and I complain about it to a bunch of strangers like you. Um, but there's that, but yeah, you, you are going to have to file. If you make income, you're going to have to file with that state. So that is, that is the thing for those of you that have assets outside of Colorado and Arizona, if you ever, some states, California is a good example of this. If you sell a, uh, a property in California and then reinvest that money in another state, California will actually require you to file state income tax returns on the property so that they can track their state income tax. So there are some states, Colorado doesn't have that, but some states have some goofy laws with regard, regards to that because California is afraid that if you ever sell that property that you temporarily want to exchange, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Landon wrote, California is the worst for income tax. Absolutely, and if you work, they're raising taxes already in California because of COVID. Um, but yeah, there, there's some goofy rules with regards to what certain states uh, 
to do um, with regards to 1031 exchanges because they're just trying to track their money. It is one o'clock on the nose. Uh, we have no other questions. Does anybody have any other further questions before we adjourn? Seeing none, thank you team for listening. We will reach out to you typically with an email to say, hey, do you want to chat? And if you want to chat about you, your situation, we will uh, look for us on upcoming webinars every, uh, every Tuesday. We do one at noon. I believe next week we have a level two for people that on, on big apartments. Um, if you want to learn some of that, you can. Please know that we want to say thank you. Be safe. Stay sane during this crazy COVID time. Thank you for your time, team. Have a good day. Bye, guys. See you. Bye-bye.